Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkies listeners. It's Friday, and I'm so excited to share Vera's interview with Dr. James Greenblatt today. So in this episode, they're going to talk about Dr. Greenblatt's personal and professional journey, what is integrative medicine, nutritional psychiatry, lithium, magnesium, zinc, and vitamin D, ADHD and anxiety, children and the standard American diet, substances of abuse, ghrelin and leptin, food addiction and eating disorder overlaps, sweeteners, obstacles and pushback Dr. Greenblatt has received, antidepressant withdrawal, and our signature question. Welcome, Dr. Greenblatt. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your host today, uh, speaking with a pioneer in the field of integrative medicine, Dr. James Greenblatt. Dr. Greenblatt has treated patients with complex behavioral and mood disorders since 1990. After receiving his psychiatric certification at George Washington University, he then became certified in child and adolescent psychiatry at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Currently, he is Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at Tufts University School of Medicine. In 2017, he was also inducted into the Orthomolecular Medicine Hall of Fame. In his training, Dr. Greenblatt studied disorders such as ADHD, behavioral disorders, anxiety, and eating disorders. He reveled in exploring and the underlying biological mechanisms that contributed to these disorders rather than taking the standard approach of just treating the symptoms with medications. This was during the 1990s, and clearly ahead of his time, he was especially interested in how to use nutritional interventions. He is author of books such as Integrative Medicine for Depression, Integrative Medicine for Alzheimer's, Nutritional Lithium, A Cinderella Story, The Untold Story of the Minerals That Transform Lives and Heal the Brain, Finally Focused, The Breakthrough Natural Treatment Plan for ADHD, and what we're particularly interested in, Integrative Medicine for Binge Eating, The Breakthrough Natural Treatment Plan That Defeats Binge Eating. We at Food Junkies are especially interested in Dr. Gleambart's inter- integrative approach to eating disorders and food addiction. So welcome, Dr. Greenblatt. Uh, thank you, Barry. It's good to be with you. Okay. So uh, if you don't mind, we always like to start with a bit of a personal story. So as much as you're willing to reveal about yourself, how did you veer from the sort of traditional path of the of psychiatry, childhood psychiatry, into something as at that particular time, probably quite unique and unusual of integrative medicine? So what got you there? Right. You know, I was interested in uh, nutrition and brain function, you know, in college. I remember writing papers on uh, nutrition and brain function. And before I went to medical school, before I did psychiatry. So it's always been my interest in nutrition and cell biology. And as I got through traditional training, it started coming back in terms of um, something's wrong with our current psychiatric model. And I. Um, One of the reasons I ended up in the field of eating disorders is that I was able to continue to talk about research and discuss nutrition and brain function because I was dealing with patients that were very malnourished due to anorexia or patients that were overnourished um, with obesity. So I was able to keep the focus for these 30 years by sticking with that eating disorder community. Okay, thank you. So let's let's start with... uh a thumbnail description of what the difference between integrative medicine is, orthomolecular medicine, and alternative medicine. What's the difference between them and what do you specifically do within those differences? Well, let's start backwards. We have to throw out the word alternative because, you know, the concepts of, of good nutrition, checking blood levels of vitamin D and B12 should not be alternative. So I see no place for this concept of alternative medicine. Orthomolecular medicine was a a term actually um, developed by Linus Pauling, you know, in the 60s. And ortho means right, 
molecular. And it was just a very academic a paper that he wrote on perhaps uh, addressing the right molecules for the brain, meaning higher doses of certain nutrients could be effective to treat mental illness. This uh, was a field that had some research to support it. But when the research was presented by Dr. Hofford to the American Psychiatric Association, they just dismissed it. So orthomolecular medicine has a negative connotation, certainly in the States, but it's a brilliant concept, uh, adjusting personalized uh, nutrients for an individual. And, you know, I've settled on the term integrative and functional medicine. Mm. Integrative means we're looking at what we used to call alternative. We're looking at all the complementary therapies, be it nutrition, mindfulness, exercise, lifestyle. And, and functional is a really important word because the, the functional medicine movement looks at underlying cause. And that is just very neglected in the field of psychiatry and certainly in the field of eating disorders. Well, okay. So, I mean, the traditional uh, view of psychiatry, especially at the time that I think we're talking about, this, starting in the 80s and 90s, there was this this big breakthrough about talking about serotonin and, you know, serotonin reuptake inhibitors and dopamine and endorphins, like there's all this discussion. And there you are talking about different molecular beings. And I'm just imagining that that the, psych, the general psychiatric approach was focusing on these other ones rather than what you were talking about. Yeah, I think when uh, Prozac uh, came out, people got excited and were prescribing it. And the pharmaceutical companies, you know, sold billions of dollars worth of medications because there was a, a a model, a chemical model. So it, it felt good for psychiatrists. They finally had a tool. Patients had an answer. And then, you know, my work has come to full circle when, you know, over the years, we realized the medicines aren't effective as we thought. Mm-hmm. The side effects are pretty devastating. And the theory is probably not as um, relevant as we thought that uh, depression is simply a serotonin deficiency. Uh huh. So, do you, in, in your work, do you um, work with uh, the, the standard traditional medications or do you just work from a different approach completely? No, I'm very committed to uh, the field of psychiatry. I, I, I work in a hospital, I, I train doctors in psychopharmacology. There is a role for medications. The, the sad part, and why it's really important that we get the message out. But there are other means that we can support patients and nutritional psychiatry is one way. So it doesn't eliminate the need for medicine. It minimizes this concept of polypharmacy, people being put on three and four or five medications. Yeah. I mean, when I started off uh, in my work, it it was only Prozac, it was solo medications. And in just in the last 20, 30 years, now it's, you know, cocktails of three or four or five, as you said, over the time, over the time. And somewhere along there, um, then the concept of nutrition has been lost, although it's becoming, it's coming back now. You use the word nutritional psychiatry. I I think it's coming back. I think patients are understanding the role. There's research to support it. And, you know, I think many of my colleagues in psychiatry might use four or five medication, as you said, cocktails, even though there's no research to support using these medicines together. But if you talk about B12 supplementation, they'll say it doesn't work because there's no research, but their day-to-day lives are prescribing meds that have no research to support these combinations. Yeah, I think that's a piece that's really important. Or the research that exists is actually um, shows results that are much more minimal than uh, than actually we think. You know. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about some of the uh, in in reading your books. Um, one of the things that really struck me was, you know, when I'm writing a prescription for a seizure disorder, or actually even just mood moderation or mood or supplementation, the the drug lithium is used. And so I'm going to prescribe 300 milligrams, 1200, uh, you know, 1200 milligrams a day, something like that. But there you are talking. And it seems like this concept of nutritional lithium is a big one in in your work. You have a book solely devoted to that. So can you explain a little bit about that? And what's, how is that different from the medication? Sure. It's really been, um, again, something I learned about in college uh, from uh, Jonathan Wright, one of the, you know, original, um, integrative docs. And so I remember reading about it, but nutrition lithium is is, uh, one of the most helpful tools I use in my practice. Lithium is an element that's in our water supply. And we know the research has been 50, 60 years that the amount of lithium in our water supply affects mental health, affects suicide risk, dementia risk, 
and early studies showed an effect uh, hospitalizations to different psychiatric uh, facilities. So this mineral has profound effects on mental health, and we started um, using it as in high doses as a medication, which also had pretty dramatic results for bipolar disorder. But there were side effects. Yep. And you know, before you talk about that, I, you you just I, you just said something I want to pick up on that that even in the water supply, it can show trends in our in, I guess in this in the uh, society around drinking that water. Are you talking about that there would be an increase in depression or that there would be a relief of depression because essentially lithium there was higher levels? Yeah, we we um, there are studies done across the globe. Yeah, in fifteen different countries, the amount of lithium in the water supply. If it's low, there was increased risk of suicide. Wow. And again, it's not one study, it's 20 studies. And uh, some of these meta-analysis were millions and millions of individuals in these studies. And it's quite, quite remarkable. Okay. So anyway, I interrupted you. You were talking about the medications uh, and the dramatic side effects or the dramatic effects. No, no. So we have medicine that, that helps, but also it decreases suicide risk. But there are side effects, and the the literature is quite clear that low doses also decrease suicide risk. And as I started um, looking into it clinically, we use um, supplements you can get over the counter of doses of lithium between one and ten milligrams wow. of lithium that has some um, significant clinical effects. The most significant symptom would be this concept of irritability. Right. So you're saying one to 12 milligrams, and I can sometimes prescribe 1200 milligrams for somebody. Correct. Yes. Okay. And that that would that could change a, a person's level of irritability. So in other words, a, a person who is living in a particular area might find themselves more irritable than elsewhere because of the lithium levels in the water. Yeah, it's that profound and that simple. Oh. And, you know, we have cases, I, I, I when I talk about lithium, I, I I always say I get the most thank you notes from parents or spouses because uh, irritability is not anything that, you know, we list in the DSM, but it cuts across all psychiatric disorders and uh, lithium can be incredibly helpful for a subset of individuals. So you can buy, you can go to a, 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 um, a nutritional store and just get this amount of lithium, 12 milligrams or 10, one milligram, whatever it is, uh, just over the counter. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So can you explain how that works? Because you, you, I mean, you attribute its effects to um, obviously the mood, you just mentioned that, but even something like Alzheimer's. Yeah. The Alzheimer's work is is preventative. And there's actually been some uh, very impressive studies looking at um, low dosages for 15 months. One study followed individuals for four years and that had a uh, preventative effect of cognitive decline. And it arrested the cognitive decline that patients were um, struggling with. Do you know what the uh, 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 mechanism of action is that makes these kind of broad changes? Yeah, it's a, it's a little complicated because um, as you dig into the uh, mechanisms of action with lithium, it, there's, um, I don't know if I'd say hundreds, but there's many uh, different um, mechanisms action. It works as a uh, kind of a messenger molecule in the brain. It, it affects multiple neurotransmitters. It's an antioxidant and it has anti-inflammatory properties. But the mechanism for Alzheimer's and dementia, it might be the mechanism for everything, hmm. is this inhibition of this enzyme called GSK3. And there are drug companies that are just working to develop drugs that inhibit GSK3 and lithium does it naturally. Wow. Okay. And and this is lithium that you would buy at a, nutri- a nutritional store. Can you can you get this in your in food like in natural foods that we might eat? It is in a small amount. Again, water supply because it's it's in the soil, so it leaches into the water supply. And um, it's small amounts in in grains and vegetables, not as much in in meat, but there's small amounts in our food supply. But I've been looking at lithium now thirty, almost thirty five years. And we do hair testing, looking at levels of lithium. Mm. And, you know, I used to get maybe 30, 40 percent uh, of these kids low um, that had behavior problems. And now I'm getting, you know, 50, 60 percent and other colleagues around the country are saying the same thing. And I don't know if it's our obsession with bottled water 
that filters out the lithium, but we're seeing more and more lithium deficiency in some of our ADHD and disruptive children. Okay. Is this something that you would recommend people take just naturally in the same way that we're now recommending people take vitamin D just just off the cuff because we just assume people are low on it? You know, my recommendation is one to two milligrams is completely safe Mm. and might have um, significant preventative, um, particularly as we age. Uh, I know a couple very traditional psychiatrists who don't take any supplements but they've studied the research on lithium and prevention of Alzheimer's, and they take lithium for the prevention of dementia for that mm-hmm. reason. Okay. All right. And and in this nutritional context, you can't really take too much. It's because, I mean, if, if I'm thinking that a normal prescription could be six or 600 milligrams, any kind of nutritional amount, just simply, you're not going to have that much, right? No. I mean, I certainly wouldn't take it if someone was pregnant uh, mm-hmm. or someone had kidney disease, but certainly the one to two milligrams is a very low dose and have never seen problems. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm I'm sort of focusing on lithium because you're the first person I've seen write about it. I mean, in the in the work that I've looked at, uh, what? But I do see a lot of stuff about magnesium, zinc, and vitamin D. And I know that those are also um, a part of the uh, basket of tools that you suggest. Am I correct? Yeah. I mean, I think um, just to bring up the vitamin D because yeah. it's getting a lot of headlines. Yes. And um, you read one head, actually, I read two in the same day that contradicted each other. One said there was no effect. And the next one said pretty dramatic effect Mm. uh, on mood. And, uh, you know, my argument or approach for all of this controversy is that everybody is different. And that as physicians and as clinicians, uh, we just test. And and if we test 10 individuals who are struggling with depression, there's going to be a subset that will have very low vitamin D. You need vitamin D to make serotonin, and those individuals should be supplemented. But the articles or the research that just gives everybody, you know, vitamin D, not everyone's going to get better because they're kind of oversimplifying who we are as individuals and uh, our individual nutritional needs. Okay. And there's a lot of um, headlines also about magnesium as being a calming agent and, you know, for anxiety. What's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's probably one of the most common deficiencies that we would see in a psychiatric practice. Mm. I think um, some of it is pretty simple. One, stress causes you to lose magnesium. As cortisol goes up and you're under stress, you're losing magnesium. People drinking lots of sodas, you know, phosphoric acid binds magnesium, makes it unavailable. But also our food supply. You, You know, when we were farming and eating whole grains off the farm, we were getting or 500 milligrams of magnesium. Most individuals now in our traditional diets are getting, in our standard American diets, are getting less than 200. Mm. So it is a probably the most common deficiency I see in a psychiatric um, practice. The dosing of magnesium, um, I, and my, my impression is basically you, you use it to tolerate uh, until you can no longer tolerate it. So that's usually somewhere between four and 600 milligrams. Can you have too much magnesium? Uh, sure. Yeah. If you have too much magnesium, you'll have loose stools yeah. and then you're losing um, and then you uh, kind of develop this magnesium deficiency. So, yes, you can have too much and, and some people absorb it differently, but usually stick into that four to five hundred milligrams a day is uh, divided a couple times is, mm. is usually appropriate. OK. And my guess is that you would say that that's something most of us should be doing as well, sort of having this sort of common morning supplementation of uh, magnesium, vitamin D, and lithium? Uh, particularly if someone's under stress okay. um, and uh, someone's eating a restrictive diet, absolutely. All right. And if you were just to follow a healthy diet, I'm going to talk about our un- standard American unhealthy diet, but if we were following like a plant-based diet or a keto diet where you're really basically not eating processed food, could you get away with just having none of these, that there's enough in the food? You know, if you're feeling well, meaning you're sleeping well and you have energy, then absolutely, I'm a firm believer we should be getting most of our nutrients from food, nutrient-dense foods. But again, everybody is different. There are going to be individuals who are eating that perfect diet that their body, just because of their genetics, need more vitamin D or more vitamin A or much more vitamin C. So I think if someone is symptomatic, uh, be it physical symptoms, aches or pains, or mental health symptoms, uh, testing um, to really personalize 
uh, a nutrient protocol is my recommendation. Okay. Well, so now I'd like to talk about, you know, the food industry and what it's done to our food supply. And, and basically, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how food industry specifically um, uh, refined carbohydrates and especially sugar can contribute to things like ADHD and anxiety. Um, so what's your, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty simple and common sense, although, you know, uh, many physicians argue about it, but I think um, when I started talking about ADHD in the nineties, there was only one study that said sugar did not affect behavior. Um, and every parent knew that it did. And so now we have many, many studies looking at the amount of refined carbohydrates, the amount of soda dramatically impacts the incidence and severity of ADHD symptoms in our kids. So would it be fair to say, I mean, just just to say right out that eating too much sugar does actually contribute to ADHD? Yes. Yes. Oh. I, the the uh, literature is is quite clear. You know, I used to use the term before we had the research that, that sugar is, is pretty much like a nutritional vacuum cleaner. So to eat refined sugar, your body has to steal the the vitamins um, and to, from the rest of your metabolism. So these kids get uh, depleted of multiple B vitamins um, that affect behavior and brain function. Because of the sugar. So essentially the brain is mopping up the sugar and then therefore they're taking resources where they could otherwise be used. Correct. So it would be fair then to say that the number one uh, first line therapy with ADHD would be to change the, the child's diet. The clearest recommendation, but the most challenging for parents. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, absolutely minimizing the ultra processed refined uh, carbohydrates um, would begin to help these kids. But often when they get to the doctor's office, it's been going on for so long, they have other nutritional deficiencies like the magnesium and, and zinc and other mm. uh, nutrients that need to be repleted as well. So one of the things that we talk a lot about in the food junkies world, in the in the food addiction world, is you know the role of sugar, especially in the context of dopamine, like the neurochemistry. But you're actually talking about sugar from a different perspective. It's it may include the dopamine, but it's also got to do with this robbing of other nutrients. Um, yes, like it's more than yeah, yeah, both. I mean, you know, in our binge eating and and for some of these kids, that certainly food addiction mechanism is powerful. Yeah, um, but sugar does have um, many, many other uh, negative effects in the body. You, you uh, mentioned in, um, I don't remember which book it is, but that, that teenagers are at particular risk for long-term damage because of the, the standard American diet. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, again, you know, there are certain genetically vulnerable kids and... Um, elaborate the, on what you mean by that. Like family histories. If you have, um, you know, two generations of depression or anxiety or eating disorders in your families, um, it is, uh, we know there's this genetic vulnerability. And if, if those kids are eating uh, either a standard junk food, ultra-processed diet, mm -hmm. they're at risk for nutritional deficiencies, which then places them at risk for the development of uh, depression, anxiety, or eating disorder. The, the other concern in adolescence for me uh, that is... Um, uh, growing to be a major problem is a, a vegan diet in oh. an adolescent. Uh, I believe that's one of the number one risk factors for uh, eating disorders in adolescents because these kids are not eating grains and beans and uh, vegetables, but they're eliminating meat and they don't have uh, adequate zinc and other trace minerals to get through puberty. Just to clarify, so you're you're saying that a vegan diet is particularly dangerous for a teenager and may set them up for an eating disorder later. And yes, is, is that that's what that's what I'm saying based on 25 years in treating anorexia. But it's also this research yeah. to support that a vegan diet, these kids, some um, uh, higher relapse rates, don't get uh, quicker. The recovery is much slower. And, yes. and that's because, but you said um, it's because they're not eating dairy and they're not eating meat, but they are eating grains and they are eating vegetables. So, so what, what is it that they're not getting? As uh, zinc, uh, zinc is mostly bioavailable in animal products. Okay. And when you go through puberty, just like pregnancy, your body needs more zinc and unlikely they're getting enough protein and unlikely they're getting enough vitamin B12. So those are the key deficiencies you know, zinc, B12, and, and amino acids that we see in many of these vegan kids, 
usually six to 12 months after they start this diet. It's just very common in the eating disorder world. Yeah, you know, I, I've always understood that uh, the vegan vegetarian, often they need supplementation with B12, but you're saying that it's more than that. It's zinc uh, and it's uh, magnesium and uh, yeah. Particularly yeah. for the adolescents. And that's what I meant by genetically awesome. vulnerable. So it's going to, you know, I, I have no problem with a vegetarian vegan adult, um, but for these kids trying to get through puberty, uh, um, it's challenging. And uh, if they worked with a dietitian, if they took supplements, that's fine. But many of these kids aren't. Yeah. And if they were at a genetic risk for, let's say, anorexia, that is the perfect storm. So can you actually some may as well get into the whole concept of eating disorders and food addiction? How does somebody uh, uh, like what's the mechanism of action there? What why is it that zinc would or the deficiency of zinc would lead somebody to be more predisposed to an anorexic type behavior? Well, I mean, the, the list is long. Uh, zinc, you know, affects digestion, all the digestive enzymes. Mm. So without adequate zinc, it, you just don't tolerate food very well. You get nauseous, you get bloated. Zinc is critically important for depression, uh, to make melatonin for sleep, and as uh, and taste. Taste buds are zinc-dependent enzymes. So there's just a long list of symptoms that our patients with anorexia typically have that are identical to symptoms of zinc deficiency. And it's a very simple comparison, but in our world of medicine, we don't really like simple solutions. Uh Okay. And then uh, you you also have, uh, I guess you've kind of addressed this before, but it struck out at me, so I'm going to highlight it, that soft drinks can affect mood. And I guess that's because of the, uh, I think it was magnesium, right? It leaches the magnesium. Yeah, the phosphoric acid, yeah. um, you know, binds magnesium. So you just lose magnesium. The more sodas you drink, the more magnesium deficient. And then, you know, the, I don't know what it is, 11 teaspoons of sugar in a can of uh, soda. And uh, some of these kids drinking five to eight a day has profound implications for health and for some mental health. Okay. So would it be fair to say that you know, like we talk about drugs like marijuana, that if the person is going to partake, it's best if you could get them to do it once they've passed adolescence, get at least 19, 20, 21, because there's less damage than if they start earlier on. Would it be fair to make the same conclusion with uh, processed food like sugars, junk food, that if we could prolong the exposure to that developing brain, we would be doing those kids a big favor? A- absolutely. We know that, you know, brain development goes on in our early 20s Mm. and between the effects of stress, trauma, malnutrition, and, you know, drugs, absolutely. Um, A developing brain is much more vulnerable. Yeah. I mean, that's the impression that I got was that this this food that we basically focus on our children, uh, we're giving it to them when the the human brain is at its most vulnerable uh, to be impacted. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So can you can you just moving on to the concept of uh, eating disorder? So you've got a book on uh, anorexia, and I think you might also have something on binge eating. I don't know, or if that was part of the anorexic one. But anyway, that the idea of um, eating disorders. So what is your understanding of eating disorders, especially in the context or in relation to food addiction? Do you see them as the same thing or as two separate things? You know, I, I think uh, I have uh, you know books on anorexia and and binge yeah. eating. And uh, I, I, I do see them as separate. There is some, uh, you know, discussion um, and there, there's some merit to talk about anorexia as a, a, an addiction to the starvation. But I, but I think the mechanisms of malnutrition, as we discuss zinc deficiency, B vitamins, are so clear uh-huh. that to me that's a separate topic. But my work with binge eating, and I use the term food addiction in the title of all my presentations now. Uh-huh. because it's it's that important. I believe these are different mechanisms, you know, related for many uh, to do with malnutrition, but also just not understanding some of the neurobiology of, of appetite and satiety. Okay. Can you elaborate a little bit on what, where is the person malnourished, especially in a binge eating? I believe you because the, the food they're eating is not nourishing food, but just if you can elaborate a little bit on that even if it's repeating what you've already said. Sure. I mean, for our binge eating disorder patients, you know, we we see deficiencies of of vitamin D, vitamin B12, 
and, and zinc being the most common. Vitamin D, again, is essential to make serotonin, yeah. and serotonin helps regulate appetite. B12 is also critical for uh, neurotransmitter synthesis and, and zinc as well. But I, I think, um, you know, our work with binge eating is, is not only filling in some of those deficiencies, but helping people understand, you know, what supports, what, what the difference is between, you know, the binge, the cravings, you know, and feeling full. And, and a lot of that, in my experience, has to do with they're eating the right foods, but they're not digesting and absorbing uh, the nutrients. Okay. So it's it's a question of malabsorption of nutrients then because they're either not getting them or because they're genetically not disposed to absorbing them as well. Yeah, specifically, um, you know, you know, I simplify, you know, uh, hunger um, or cravings to, uh, you know, biochemical basis and we can, and the brain responds to, to fat uh, and, and but the brain also responds to amino acids. And what we have found is the, deficiency in most of our binge eating disorder patients are in these essential amino acids, which is from protein. So uh, many of these individuals are eating chicken, steak, or fish, but we do testing and look at levels of amino acids and they're profoundly deficient. So one of our interventions is to again give them the, the, the digestive enzymes and the acid to break down the protein oh. and then give them the amino acids to help their brain make all the peptides to say, okay, you're full. You don't have to keep going. So so that might explain why one person might do really well on a keto diet, for example, and another person may not because they don't have those essential digestive enzymes. Absolutely, yes. And it's particularly hydrochloric acid. It's the acid, uh -huh. um, which is, a, again, a zinc-dependent enzyme in the stomach that we've seen to be the most efficient in many of our patients with um, binge eating. So how would you discover that? Like, what kind of tests would you do? Because I've never heard of, I, I, I'm not aware that you can do a, a zinc level or a hydrochloric acid level. Like, how do you determine this information? Well, in the old days, people used to have you swallow a pH meter to look at, you know, uh, acid. But, but the simple test that we look at is just a, a fasting level of amino acids. Mm. So your essential amino acids, it's a simple blood test. And even though you know, dietary history is quite clear they're getting adequate protein. Uh, I look at these um, amino acid uh, tests and they're, they're deficient. So to me, that's just a simple equation. It's not dietary intake. It's inadequate acid. The brain is always saying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. And so they're eating and they're eating. And when we give them the amino acids, we give them the digestive enzymes with hydrochloric acid, they begin to uh, start regulating their appetite. Okay. Uh, well, speaking of appetite, you, you've written a, something about uh, leptin, and can you elaborate a little bit about that? Like how you work with that? Because that's a satiety, that's a hunger hormone. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, certainly, um, you know, there's a lot of talk now about um, these these peptides and, and leptin resistance based on this ultra processed food. Yes. But I kind of lump all the the these peptides, uh, ghrelin, leptin, and there's many, NPY and dynorphin, all these peptides, researchers all over the world are looking at the answer to obesity, mm -hmm, but yes. they're all peptides. They're all based on amino acids. So our work over the years is really not measuring many of these peptides, but just supplying the raw materials, yeah. which are these essential amino acids. Yeah. So, I, I mean, so, okay. So that approach, that's truly preventative. So when you do a test for amino acid levels. I mean, that's to me thinking about a psychiatrist doing that, that's just unheard of. So how do you manage to do something like that in the world of psychiatry as it stands today? Like if you go to an eating disorder clinic, I don't think that you, you must feel very different than what, what's traditionally being done. Uh, yes, I think it's um, it's frustrating. Um, and certainly as, as parents, I get calls from parents uh, across the country about some simple nutrients that the eating disorder program said, no, you can't take this multivitamin or you can't take okay. essential fatty acids. But I, I think things are changing. I think people are more open and understanding to everything from the gut microbiome to digestive enzymes to understanding the role of, of zinc. So things are changing, but uh, probably not fast enough for 
many of these kids because eating disorders are life-threatening. These are not just a simple behavioral problems. Yeah. So I, for, you know, for our listeners, it sounds to me like if any, if you have children who have ADHD or somebody with uh, suffering from anorexia, the beginning signs of that and send them to a, a clinic, they won't hear about what you're talking about. They have to buy your books. Like you, you, you show a whole different perspective, almost like the precondition and how to address it at that level. I, th- I think there's a growing number of, of integrative and functional medicine docs that that understand a lot of this material, and um, and we've been training docs now for three years. So we have lists of other uh, you know integrative and functional medicine psychiatrists and nurse practitioners who do understand the connection between nutrition and brain function. Okay. Uh, so what what is there um, uh, specifically, you said that you now always mention food addiction when you uh, uh, do slides. Uh, what do you see as different from food addiction and uh, binge eating disorder or bulimia? Or actually even anorexia because you saw that there was an addictive component there. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if different is a word. I think there's overlap. There are individuals mm-hmm. that have binge eating disorder that I wouldn't see it as a, a physiological addiction of the way I would see others. So there's a subset. Okay. And I, I believe are stimulated by the refined sugar and that becomes addictive, like we know for animal models as mm-hmm. well as for humans. But it's not everybody. You know, we, we know the people that can eat all that junk food and and not eat it for a week. Mm-hmm. Other people are, are tortured and, and really do have withdrawal, if you will. I also discuss in the food addiction model things like MSG and high fructose corn syrup. But MSG also has powerful addictive qualities. For some individuals, um, people crave food with MSG in it. And, you know, we've taken it out a lot of Chinese restaurants over the past 25 years. Mm. And now they're putting it back in. And, and McDonald's is bragging about MSG in their chicken sandwich to make it taste better. But I, I assure you, uh, there's a subset of individuals that once they taste that MSG, they can't stop. I mean, I've had people with the Chinese restaurants in the old days that would start getting cravings when they drove down the street of the Chinese restaurant. You know, that, that I find that fascinating because we, we hear so much about sugar and fats and the combination of that, you know, with salt, but I've not actually heard of people talking about MSG as that, but it might explain why some people will say they like the savory rather than the sweet. They prefer the the barbecue chicken and the, 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 the fried meats rather than the, uh, the sweets. So it could be the MSG. Yes. Yeah. For a subset. And, uh, wow. you know, you just hear the stories of driving through the Kentucky fried chicken at, at you know, three in the morning. But uh, just like sugar, it's, it's not everyone, but there's a subset and it's just so simple uh, to be aware of it. And it's um, in just all of our processed foods. OK, so so just to sort of close this little piece off, um, do you believe that if if it is. So it sounds to me like you're saying there is a subsection of the population that can actually be addicted either to MSG or to sugar. And it's not just a nutritional deficiency platform. Uh, but do you, do you believe that if you did correct the nutritional deficiencies, that some people might be able to be better and eat junk food, like that they can go back to eating junk food again or sugar? I think there might be some individuals uh, that could tolerate some uh-huh. You know, people talk about carbohydrate addiction yes. and, and talk about abstinence and, and, and the keto movement. You know, I, I, I believe that uh, we talk a lot about low carb and uh-huh. keto as a mechanism, as a tool. I don't always believe it has to be a lifestyle. Okay, right. So if you take the, if you take the supplements, you might actually be able to uh, tolerate those foods otherwise. Like you don't have to be abstinent. You can, you can eat them moderately. I believe so, yes. Okay. Okay. But you, you acknowledge that there might be a small subsection that they can't, or am I putting words in your mouth there? No, no. I mean, they can't without interventions. And part of our binge eating model, you know, is, um, you know, I talk about the amino acids. I talk about fats, eating enough fats so you're full. And I also talk about medications. There's some individuals where for a period of time, six months, we might need to use medications to help them kind of retrain their brain and um, develop that kind of confidence and self-esteem and not just feel that kind of shame and guilt from unable to control their appetites. Okay, and and I'm taking, you mean by that, uh, the antidepressants or the stimulants? Well, all the above. Uh, We use um, 
the stimulants. We use antidepressants, Topamax. Yeah. Uh, I use probably more often. And for some individuals, we use naltrexone because oh, yeah. I do treat it as a as an addiction. Okay, good. Uh, you you have some writing about um, sugar alternatives, and you mentioned something about xylitol. As as I, I think I I don't know if you can you say a little bit more about that. What, what's your what's your take on nutri- on sweeteners? I think um, to help somebody transition, you know, some somebody who's really addicted to ultra processed food, who has food addiction, binge eating. I'm uh, of the school that a, a little artificial sweetener, whatever is, can be used as a bridge, is fine. I, I think over time we know, as you know, xylitol is a little better than some of the fake chemicals, but they, they all affect the, the microbiome, and we want to kind of be careful in how we use them long term. But I do think the refined sugar being the most destructive. So however we can support our patients to uh, eliminate or cut that back is the goal. Okay. So would it be fair to say as an overall summary then that your approach would be to eliminate if possible and or to support and uh, the transition towards elimination and then to take the extra supplementation wherever it might be required, like magnesium, zinc? Uh, lithium. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So generally speaking, then, especially in the context of eating disorders, but in general psychiatry, what are some um, major obstacles that you have uh, approached? I mean, I appreciate that more and more people are writing it or, you know, functional medicine is becoming more acceptable now, but what are some obstacles through the years? You've been, in, you're one of the pioneers and how, how have you managed to get through? You know, I think, um, Again, you know, 25 years in the eating sort of world, it was easy for me to give grand rounds and talk about zinc deficiency and essential fatty acids. Mm -hmm. Um, I I do think the major obstacle is the pharmaceutical industry is is doing all the research. Um, They're courting all the young doctors and it's just a simple model and that uh, provides income and doesn't get to the root cause. So it's really been the over-reliance on one tool, medications, that has really made it challenging to help convince the field that we can look a little deeper and it, it's okay if it's simple. A B12 test is simple mm-hmm. and it has profound that. effects on mental health. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, uh, as an addictions physician, I've been traditionally doing vitamin D levels and vitamin B12 levels as well. But I, I'm always astounded that I'd say two thirds of the, of my population are like really deficient, really, not even just a little bit, probably the whole of society. So have you experienced any pushback from your, um, from your colleagues? You know, I think, um, uh, there's not pushback anymore. There certainly was early on. I think now it's, a little more of uh, what patients are telling me is that doctors are saying, I don't know anything about this. You should see, you know, someone else versus just dismissing it right. uh, directly. Right. Okay. What are you working on now? Like, didn't your, your last book just come out recently? Yeah, we just uh, finished the book on antidepressant withdrawal. Oh, syndrome. I haven't seen that one. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that, because it, it's just such a uh, misunderstood and uh, nobody really um, as a treatment protocol. It's so, such again, a necessary, yeah, it's such a necessary. Can you just say a little bit about that? Like, is that a gain? Do you just it, it enhance your magnesium and zinc or is there something else? Well, I, I mean, sometimes it could be simple, but there's usually, um, again, you know, we put people on medications mm. and, and we know, you know, person A has severe withdrawal and, and debilitated. Person B on the same dose has no withdrawal. So we can't just blame the medicine. It's the medicine interacting with this child or adult biochemistry. So we're just, uh, you know, digging deeper into that biochemistry. And some of the most common are what you described, B12 and vitamin D deficiency. And you withdraw the the medicine. The body can't make enough serotonin. You get many of these symptoms. So it's really repleting uh, multiple nutrients, ideally based on testing uh, rather than just guessing. Okay. You know, I, I have to say, uh, we, we've uh, interviewed a couple of other people from the nutritional um, or functional medicine world. And the impression I got was 
you'd have to you really buy a bag full of, 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 of nutrients to you know deal with our, de- our deficiencies. But it doesn't sound from what you're saying, it just sounds like you just cover your bases. You know, folks, make sure you get your lithium of one to 12 milligrams a day and your magnesium of maybe four or 500 milligrams and the zinc and the vitamin B12 and D and you're you've covered a lot of bases. Or am I making it too simple? Well, I think uh, that's a simplified version, but if we did that as a as a public health initiative, yes, I mean, yes. we would dramatically change both the addiction world um, and um, you know suicide rates and everything else. There are more tests that we can do, but there are very simple interventions that uh, would have profound implications for mental health of our kids and um, those struggling with mental illness. Thank you. I mean, that's a great way to summarize our talk. Just one last question that we ask all people, and that's our signature question. And that is, uh, if there's anything that you could tell a younger version of yourself, either a a young researcher or uh, moving into psychiatry, about the whole world of uh, nutritional um, or or orthomolecular medicine, what would it be? I I think the most important thing I, I could say is that it's not excluding your traditional training in psychotherapy and and psychopharmacology. It's just a augmentation world that will improve patient outcomes and you will feel better about the work that you do. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. That's a very nice summary. So thank you very much, Dr. Greenblatt, for uh, speaking with us today at Food Junkies Podcast. No problem. Thank you, Vera. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.